the content of our session today. It's an introduction to Digimap collections. So what I'm going to go through with you is um, how to go about finding information on the maps and map data that we have available. And I'll give you a demonstration of the key applications within the Digimap collections, which are a Roam application or mapper and the data download application. Um, we'll mention copyright and citation, and then there'll be time for questions. So um, on the maps and data that we have available, um, we have 11 Digimap collections, some of which you can see on um, this screenshot that I've got here, Ordnance Survey, Historic, I'm on the geology one in this image, Marine, Environment, Aerial, LIDAR, um, Global and more. Um, so with each um, collection, um, there is a data tab um, on the, the website. So on our Digimap Collections website, if you're interested in geology, for example, um, there are various tabs here to give you some information. So the one that I've highlighted is the data tab, and that details all of the mapping products that we have available for that collection. Um, so our Digimap Collections website, our homepage, if you like, is a really good place to start if you want to find out what maps and data we have available. Um, in addition to that, um, we have help pages um, and within our data download facilities, um, you'll find that um, there are help pages um, and product information boxes uh, for each individual data product that we have. So there's various sources um, of information on the data that we have available. So moving on to our applications, um, I'm going to give you a demo of um, Rome today. Um, and Rome is our mapper. Um, it allows you to browse all of the maps that we have available. Um, you can also print them uh, as PDF or just as a PNG image. Um, there is a Roam application for each collection um, and these vary um, by collection, but the, the, the standard um, layout and functions are the same. What Roam allows you to do is to browse the maps we have, but also customize them. Uh, you can add drawings, polygons, markers, and so on. Um, you, we have an overlay facility where you can add um, some additional data. Um, you can select the map features and get some information about them. And something that's potentially useful to you is you can add in a web map service. Um, many providers of geospatial data provide their data as a web map service, which means you can browse uh, the maps. You may have used some of these on things like national library websites. But um, Rome offers you the ability to import those web map services and um, view that data along with our maps. So that's potentially really useful um, for you. So we'll show you where you access that feature. And then our data download facility allows you to actually download mapping data for further analysis. If you're going to do that, what you will need um, typically is some additional software. Um, uh, some of the more popular geographic information software are ArcGIS, QGIS. We have a lot of users who use AutoCAD um, to um, create models, 3D models um, for architecture and, and site plans. So I hope that's a kind of useful basic distinction between what the Roam and the data download applications allow you to do. Um, we do have what you see on this screenshot is, yeah, you see Roam, data download, and then there's a button called web services. So what allows, that allows you to do is um, to get a link to any of our um, collections. So if you were interested in taking our geology Digimap mapping data and viewing it in another service, such as ArcGIS or QGIS, it would allow you to get a link to it and view that within another uh, software application. You would still need your login details for that because it's licensed data um, that we're dealing with. But the benefit of um, using web map services is you don't need to um, store, download and um, manipulate data. Um, so that's a, a useful way if you need to use our data in other applications. Emma, I don't know if you've got anything else you would say about the web map services from there. No, only to say that um, because the maps are provided by a third party, we don't have any control over whether they will work or not. So um, it, it's quite possible to find a link and assume that if you put it into Digimap, it will display in Digimap. If it doesn't display, it is entirely possible in fact, quite probable that it's not something to do with Digimap, it's something at the supplier's end. So it'll be the third party operating the WMS who you'd have to contact to say, why isn't this working? Okay, thank you, Emma. 
Okay, so I mentioned, um, this is a, a screenshot of our room application. Um, I mentioned that there's a, a separate room for each collection. So the one that I've taken an image of here is the one in our Ordnance Survey collection. Um, but the layout and key functions are the same um, for every room. So once you've used one, then you know you can easily navigate um, your way around the other ones. Um, I've put on some little um, notes just to um, help identify the different areas. So in the top toolbar here, we've got a search box where you can search with place names, postcodes, coordinates, and other features like the printing option, two up, which is, allows you to view two maps um, together to compare two maps. Um, and then in the map window, this is where you're viewing the map and we have a base maps facility um, that allows you to select a different um, map at the same scale. So these are um, typically, they're either the same map, but just in a different style. So this one, we've got a full color style or a line drawing style, or they're a different map product altogether, but you can view it at the, same, the scale that you're currently at. And um, we have something called an opacity slider, which you can't quite see there, but that allows you to make your map, you know, either fade it out a little um, or, or make it um, full color. There is also a, a zoom bar, which allows you to um, zoom in to in and out to different scales. And there's an indication of the scale information at the bottom right um, of the, the map window. In the sidebar menu, there are um, several different tools available to you. There is map content where you can select um, which map features you want to display. So if you want a more simple map and you don't want to display um, buildings, for example, you could choose to, to remove those. We have an overlays. Sorry, Emma. It's worth adding there, under the map content, not every map you see has the possibility of controlling the content. So some of them are raster maps, which means they are just fixed. They're like pictures. Um, but some of them are what we call vector maps, and therefore you can add and remove features. If you don't see the check boxes there, that means that your map can't be customised. Yeah, great. Well, I'll have a little look at that when we do a demo as well. Thank you. So in the overlays, this are these are pre-prepared data sets, which you can simply check the box to add them to your data. So uh, these are the ones we have available in the Ordnance Survey collection, um, points of interest, contours and spot heights, postcodes and hill shading. But those overlays will vary um, depending, on the uh, depending on the Digimap collection that you're in. Not all of them are, are relevant um, to the maps in that particular collection. So that is a little overview of Rome. Uh, sorry. There's other features in the sidebar menu here. Um, there are drawing tools, which allow you, as I mentioned, to add markers, polygons, images, grid reference markers, and so on. We have measurement tools where you can measure um, distance and area. Um, there's a map information tab, which I'll show you, which has a lot of useful information um, about the, the mapping product that you're viewing, the default scale, and so on. And then there's also the ability to save your maps within uh, Digimap collections. By saving, you're saving it within Digimap so that it's available the next time you log in. Um, if you want to export the map, it's the print facility that you would use. And that would allow you to export it either as PDF or PNG, as I mentioned. Now, what I'm going to do is give you a little demo of Rome, just to create a very simple um, location map um, as an A5 PDF print. So I've just um, created a simple conference venue map it's in York, um, at York St. John University. So these are the steps that I took to create this map on the left here. I found my location, zoomed in. I changed the base map. This is a plan base map that I'm looking at. Um, I changed the map content. And I've added um, some simple drawings. I've added a polygon, uh, a grid reference marker, and uh, a label of our location. And then I've added in the points of interest overlay. So because it's a, a location map for a conference venue, this is a, a, an overlay that's potentially useful. It you know, gives you information like parking, bus stop, places to eat and so on. And then um, what you're looking at there is the actual um, A5 portrait print from Digimap. So you can see the print gives you the option to add a title and it gives you the copyright statement significantly. That's always on the prints that you generate from Digimap. And it also adds these things like a scale bar and um, you, know, you can choose to have your, your name and date and so on on it as well. So before I do that, um, I'll also show you that within Rome, I think this is potentially in, uh, useful for a lot of people who are new to dealing with uh, geospatial data, 
that Roam allows you to add in your own data as well. So there's two ways to do this within Roam. We have a drawing tools menu, which I had used to um, add the polygon and so on in that previous uh, print I showed you. And within that, there is an import tab. And that allows you to import files uh, in the formats, which hopefully you can see um, on that image, shape files, KML, which are from Google Earth, uh, GPX, so you could add in um, GPS tracks from, uh, you know, whatever GPX apps you're using. You can add in simple spreadsheets, a CSV file, and also GeoJSON um, files. Um, but the maximum upload size for those is 10 megabytes. So if you do source some data that's um, interesting and you'd like to view it along with a map, you can use that import facility to do that. But there is also another option, number two, which is within the overlays menu, you can add a web map service. Um, and these, there's, you know, you can add to, you can choose to either add a WS feed that you've already identified. So, um, you know, it could be from something like the environment agency and um, that you find some data that you want to add in and view, or we do have some available. So there's two buttons here, manually add in your web map service. That's using the link that you've identified, or you can search a WMS, WMS feed. Um, and that is when you, uh, you can have a look at the ones that we have available. So, Viv, Viv, yes, can I add a bit there about um, importing the, the data? Um, yeah. For anybody who has a uh, GPS watch or something like that, this is this is really useful. I, I've I've done this for testing purposes by going for a walk, taking my watch with me, and taking the GPS the GPX track out of it. One thing I have found though is that if I go on a really long walk and the GPX track is, has got loads and loads and loads of points in it, it can struggle to upload it because there's just too many points to, to manage. Um, just something to be aware of. So it, it sometimes it's not necessarily the file size, it's the sheer number of points in that file that can, can cause difficulty. So it, it's been a pretty long walk where I've, where I've come across that problem. So for, most, for, for the most part, it wouldn't be a problem, but um, just something to make people aware of, that's all. Great, thank you, Emma. So what I'm going to do is um, show you in Rome how um, I created that map and we'll have a little look at where you can add in uh, data as well at those two options. So I'll open up Rome. Okay, so um, how to quickly create that little location map. So I've searched for York and selected York from the, the place name results in the search on the left. Um, so what I want to do now is um, zoom in on my location. But before I zoom in, I'm going to show you um, what Emma was talking about in the map content area. So if I open the map content on the left here, so this is where I'm hoping to be able to, uh, you know, select which features I want to display. This one says this view has no layer selection. So that means that, as Emma said, this is a raster map and um, it's a digital map image. So we can't select any of the features from that map. If I now open the base maps on the map window, what you'll see is that um, I've got a selection of a few here. This one's a raster map. Uh, I can select the same map, but in grayscale. But again, it still says this view has no layer selection. If I select a different map here, vector map district, you can see I now have the, the function here to check and uncheck um, the different layers. Um, so within this vector map, <clears throat> I have different categories of map features, which I could choose to hide or display. So if I just uncheck roads, then that removes all of them from there. But I can be a little more um, detailed than that. If you click, uh, select the little down arrow, sorry, the arrow to the left of any checkbox, then it opens up and you can see um, that feature category in more detail. So for this map, I may not want um, the major routes into York, but I might want to put in minor roads, streets, private roads, and so on. So you can muck about with uh, the map content, but that is a good tip that Emma made that, you know, if, um, you've the default view for a map at a particular scale is a raster map, which it was in this case. Always have a look at the base maps and see if they have the map content um, functionality. If you see the word vector, then more often than not, you're going to be able to um, select which features you want to display. If it's a raster map, then typically you won't be able to. So I'm going to go back to my raster map now and I'll just zoom in on York St John University here. Where am I? I've got myself lost. It's just beside the Minster, isn't it? OK, 
Okay, so just a few quick steps to create that little location map. Um, I chose the line drawing style, I think. Um, these are um, very popular with our architecture and um, urban design students. They often want a more um, simple map style um, that, you know, so they can then highlight different aspects of the site more easily. Um, So the next thing I did was to add in the points of interest. So I've opened the overlays um, menu on the left hand side. And if I just take the box that then adds in these points of interest here. Um, again, if I click the little arrow next to it, I've got more um, options here. I can choose which of those I want to see. I'm not sure how visible this text will be to you, um, but there are different categories of points of interest here. You know, so I could choose not to include the public infrastructure or manufacturing ones, for example. You can decide which you want to show. Um, there are also layers here for contours and spot heights. Um, how visible those will be on a map at this scale, I'm not sure. But um, I think you need to bit. zoom out a bit to see them, don't you? You'll yeah. get a better picture if you zoom out a bit. You'll see more yeah. of them because they're the scale of the contour data is coarser than the scale of the master map you're looking at. They're also not so I visible. York is really flat. <laughs> exactly, I know. Um, but they are there. Um, so there's some contours in here. So what I'm going to do is switch those off. And I'm going to show you this um, Get Future Information um, facility. So up at the top on the top toolbar here, there's it says click on Map for Future Information. So if I select that and uh, select any of those um, points of interest, it tells me what they are. Um, so that's another way to, to interact with the map um, is using that get feature information. I personally haven't used get feature info an awful lot with the ordnance survey maps, but certainly with uh, the geology maps, it's a really, really useful tool when you're not sure what the different rock types are. It's also very useful Viv, for the historical maps if you want to know the exact publication date of a particular map sheet that you're looking at. That's, that's where, true. for me, yeah. that's where it really comes into its own because yeah. otherwise the maps all look the same and you can't see the boundaries between the maps because we've made them seamless. But yeah. if you want to see a particular building, it'll tell you the publication date of that particular sheet. That's true. Well, hopefully we'll have time to, to look at historic maps. Um, time permitting, um, we might be able to have a look. OK, so let's quickly show you how to use the drawing tools then. I'll switch back those points of interest back on. And then the drawing tools are the next um, item on the list. We've changed our drawing tools recently and hopefully improved them. So there is a little tour popping up at the moment. I'll just dismiss that for now. You guys can have a look at that at your leisure. So the options we have on the drawing tools are to add markers. Uh, so we have different marker styles, um, which you can just, it's very simple. You just select any marker, click on the map at the right location and that's it. Um, in terms, we also, you can add different shapes, either polygons or predefined shapes. Uh, there are line options, text options. You can add in your own images as well. <clears throat> we also had a, uh, have a grid reference um, tool. So that was one of the options which I had on my little map. So by just popping that on there, I do then have a grid reference for the, the conference venue. I'll quickly add in the, the title. Um, when I select text, um, I can then choose which size of text, which colour. There, there's different options you can play around with here. So then I just click on the map and um, type in my text. And I also use the polygon tool to add a little polygon over it to make it more visible. So when I select polygon, there's some style settings pop up below. So you've got some options here in terms of the, the colours of the line and the, the fill, which you can choose. So for a polygon, it's simply a matter of clicking at the map at the point where you wish to start and following around the shape. I'm doing this very roughly, but lots of people zoom in and do it in a lot more detail. Oh, sorry, I don't know why that little tail came off there. Um, we do also have a measurement label option, which I didn't put on my map, but I'll just show you, um, which you can use um, on any um, lines or shapes that you've added, you can pop that on and get the area. There's also a really uh, useful tool. Again, I'm going beyond the scope of my map, but it's, it's good to show you what's here. There's a buffer tool in here. So I'm going to add a point buffer uh, with a radius of, let's say, 
half a mile. Uh, so I can choose, I'll choose a different color for this one. I'm going to make it orange. And if I just select the middle of the, the learning center of our venue, and then I'll zoom out a little to show you that that's added a, a buffer of a half a mile around about um, the venue. So this is quite a heavily used function, um, you know, for users trying to analyze what lies within particular, um, particular areas. So that is, I think, all the key features in Rome. There is a lot more to explore, certainly, on the drawing tools, um, things you can do. But I hope that's just a, a useful basic introduction um, on what's possible. The print facility is up at the top here. So again, you can give it a title. And this is quite important. Um, there is a default print scale. So for this particular map scale that we're looking at in Rome, it's 1 to 20,000. However, you may need a particular, a very specific scale um, for your map, and you can change this, provided it's within this print scale range, which is highlighted in the box here. So I can choose this, uh, a scale from 1 to 6,000 up to 1 to 35,000. So many of our users do want a really specific scale. Um, so you can select that in here. Print format, um, PDF, PNG or JPEG, um, whichever is your preference. And there's a range of print sizes, A0 um, down to A5, portrait or landscape. And then you can choose to uh, whether you want to include your name, the drawings you've added. And for um, our GB-based services, you can also add in national grid lines as well. You can choose to add a legend, um, but that will then give you a, a file with two, with two files in it, the print and the legend file. So I'm going to say no to that for now. And uh, well, I won't click generate print file because you've seen the example on the slides. Now, is there any questions coming in, Emma, on Rome and possibilities before I look at the adding in data stuff? Classic unmute problem. Um, some, some questions, but I think I've managed to answer most of them. There are some folks who would quite like to see the historic maps, okay. if that's possible. Sure. Um, one more about the yes, the polygons that you draw and then find the area. That's only the footprint. It doesn't tell you the volume of the building that you've drawn. Um, I've got one question. Sarah, Sarah sorry, Sarah, if you're, if you're listening, you've said, can you just save the file? Um, can you tell me which file you're referring to? I may have missed something Viv said um, in concentrating on typing. <laughs> Multitasking, it's quite hard to listen with one ear and type. Yeah. Well, I suppose I spoke about saving things within Digimap. Um, so that is in here. So if I just say save map, um, that saves um, this map view and all the different uh, drawings and overlays that I've added to it. Um, and then it's available the next time I log into Digimap. So let's select, for example, here's one I've worked on in the past, Carlisle flood areas. So if I just select that from my list of saved maps, it will open it for me. And it tells me the map you're opening includes drawings. Do you want to replace the current drawings with the ones you've added here or merge them? And I'm going to say replace. I'm not fussed about keeping that. So this is just a map that I worked on at um, some point a couple of years ago. Um, so that's what the save facility will do for you. The, the other point to add, Viv, is that if you save a map in, say, the OS Rome, but you then want to open those drawings in the historic room, then saving your map there will allow you to open the same drawings in whichever other room you want to use. So if you were trans, uh, let's say you were tracing around a building, a modern building, you could save that map as my modern building. Then if you go to historic room, you could open the my modern building map and you'll find that your drawing outline will appear with the historical maps underneath it. So you'd be able yeah. to see what was on the site of your modern building in 1890 or, or whenever. That's quite a useful way to do things. Yeah, I've got an example of that here, actually. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this one map called Custom House. So that's something that I've, I've created a drawing in, a histor in historic Rome from a 1920s map of the Custom House in Liverpool. So if I go to that one, what I'd done there is um, outlined the old Customs House on the, the Mersey. Um, and then it's a nice way to, for people to be able to visualise when they zoom in that there's actually a hotel and a bus station there now. Um, so that's an example um, of using that. But yeah, for Sarah, yeah, that's saving your map within Digimap. 
if you want to export it as a, a PDF, then you have to print it. Um, I'm wondering if maybe Sarah's wondering about the files for importing. Possible. Uh, Sarah says, thank you. So I'm assuming the question, oh, the Rome, which was going to be printed. Right. So um, can you go to print, Viv? Sure. If you print a map, you can have one of three print options. They all look the same, but the format of the file is different. You can either have a PDF file, which is just a normal PDF, or you can have it as a PNG image or a JPEG image. So to try and answer two questions in with one answer here, if you wanted to copy your map image into another piece of software, be it PowerPoint or Word or something, I would suggest you use either the JPEG or the PNG. If you want to chop out a bit of map out of that, you can use some image software like Photoshop or Paint or something to chop out the bit that you, you need. Please don't chop out the copyright statement. I'm obliged to say that with my licensing hat on. Copyright statement must be on the map. Um, if you, let me go back to my questions again. Uh, cop, yes, copy, copy the Word document is, is one way of doing it. Or, um, Sarah, you can just save the file as a JPEG or PNG or PDF and then use it as, as you would any other file. That's, that's another option. Thank you, Emma. So just to recap, we've created that little York venue location map uh, and that's shown us a few of these different um, functions on the left here. What we've not looked at is how you would import data. So I mentioned in, on that slide there was two ways to do that. So the first of which is available within the drawing tools. So I was within the drawing tools I was working on the create area here adding in markers, shapes and so on. There's also an import option which I showed you in a screenshot. So this is where I can add in my own data it could be as simple as um, a list of postcodes um, that, where you've collected data and you want to visualise those on a map, um, or it could be you know, data that you've sourced from a different agency. So why don't I select a file and try and add something in. So on my desktop, okay, I've got a selection here of, uh, there's a couple of spreadsheets um, and there's some, some different files. Why don't we try this Carlisle Urban Flood Warning? This would be one that I've sourced from one of the environment agencies. I'm going to say replace annotations. Okay, so I think I sourced this file from uh, the environment agency some time ago um, and it is what I, I don't know if you noticed that what I selected was a zip file. So this is a shape file that's been created um, to show these areas where you know, within Carlisle, there's a risk of flooding. Um, so if you only need to uh, create a map of something and visualise it for your for your work, I think this is a, a really useful way just to get your visualisation. If you're someone who needs to go into more depth, you know, Emma is a, a GIS practitioner. Um, if you need to analyse this data um, uh, within with the attributes within it, I don't know if you can give me an example of that, Emma, then you can't you can't do a lot of analysis within Rome. You would need to be looking at different software for that. What yes, kind of analysis would you do with, with flood warning data? Yeah, uh, well, it depends on what you see there is simply the spatial representation of the area your, your information covered. The real information is held in what we call an attribute table at the back there. So if you wanted to look at, um, say, the depth of flood water or the speed with which it rose or water quality associated with it or something like that, you would need to be looking at GIS software to, to take advantage of the attributes associated with the spatial bits. What you see here is just the spatial bit. So you'd need something like ArcGIS or QGIS to make any further sense of it, I think. Okay, super. Thank you, Emma. There is also an export tab here on this drawing tools area as well. So um, if you do a lot of work and, uh, you know, map out a lot of polygons um, within uh, Digimap, you can then export those in these three different formats. If you then want to, you know, use that work that you've done um, in uh, an additional software package. So there are three formats available there for export, shapefile, KML or GeoJSON. So that's option one for importing your own data. If you find a file um, or if you create a file, you can import it and view it in here. The next option is within the overlays menu. So you've already seen that I um, turned on points of interest, contours and so on. There's also postcodes available there. Um, 
I'm going to go back to York because I think I've got a potentially useful WMS added in here. So we've tried these out, but there's another tab here for web map services. Um, now, I haven't got an awful lot of web map services that I've added into my menu, but I've got one here, environment data, WMS service, again, one that I've sourced from the environment agency. And you can see here, it's got the flood map um, on it. So if I just turn that on, those pink lines are the areas from that web map service where, you know, the, where York's at risk of flooding. York, like Carlisle, floods, floods regularly. So the benefit of finding and adding in a web map service, um, again, you can only view it. You can't do any real analysis on it. Um, but if you only need to visualize it, then by finding a web map service, um, I think you're more confident in the currency of the data and you don't have to deal with storing and manipulating data in formats that may be difficult for you without different software applications. So the WMS does have a lot of advantages if you find the appropriate data set, of course. I'm gonna turn that one off because I've also got the Digimap Geology um, WMS in here. So if I turn that on, hopefully, as I zoom out, you can see this is what you would see um, within Geology Digimap at this particular scale. You would see all the different polygons for the different uh, rock types. So adding a WMS is a matter of finding the URL and then adding it into here. I won't say any more on that for the moment. I hope that's given you a, a good idea of the functionality of Rome and the possibilities. And if there's any other questions, then just shout. So we've looked at this, the two methods of adding data. Um, I've got another example here. We've looked at one within the little demo, but here's just another quick one, which I had an image of, where I've sourced a file of polygons on marine consultation areas from Scot Scottish National Heritage. So you can see here's the, the polygon that I've zoomed into and walk along, and then I've customised the map by adding in some different images there. And we've seen this one already. Um, you can add a WMS that you've identified. And we do have an, a help page um, with some um, details of suitable organisations that you might want to look at. Um, but as I mentioned, you can also add in the web map service for the other Digimap collections. So if you want to view the geology or the historic Digimap data, the maps, along with, for example, the Ordnance Survey collection, you can use this web services button to get the appropriate link for that. So I'll give you a little um, look at data download as well. Um, and I've just put in a very simple case study. This is a, a very common query that we get um, for someone who needs detailed topographic mapping data because they want to create a site plan in AutoCAD. Uh, they're also interested in the building heights and in adding a background map to their model. So what I've put here um, are the steps um, which you need to go through in order to get the data you require out of the data download facility. Um, I'll do a demo of these as well, but essentially it's a, a stepped process um, where you highlight the area on the map. So in this image, I've highlighted this area here. I think that's Nine Elms at, at Battersea Power Station. Um, so the first step is selecting that area of interest. And there are several tools to let you do that. It looks like I've used the polygon tool. Maybe you can also just draw a rectangle on the map, but there's lots of options there you can use a tile name if you had a British National Grid tile name. Uh, you could import your own polygons in order to um, get a very exact um, area. So that's step one, highlight the area. And then two, it's a matter of selecting the data you need um, from the list here. So this is one category, the OS master map data that I'm showing you here. And it's simply a matter of checking the boxes for the data that you, you require and then adding it to the basket. And then Within the basket, you select the format and other options. So I will flip back to Digimap. Hopefully you can see Digimap again. Yep. And I'm gonna go into the data download. Apologies to those of you that aren't primarily Ordnance Survey Collection users, but it is our you know, most frequently used collections. So that's why I chose it for this um, for this 
demo. So let's I'm just search for Battersea and I'll just zoom into um, this area here where there's a lot of development going on at present. Now, one uh, key thing to note is, um, hopefully it doesn't sound very obvious, but you know the maps you're seeing here don't reflect the data that you're getting. They're simply to help you locate the area that you need data for. Um, as I mentioned, select area of interest is the first step. So you can either draw a rectangle. So I just select the tool and click and release to draw a rectangle on there. Or you could draw a polygon if you wanted a more specific area. Um, you can use the buffer. So if you wanted um, everything that was in within, I don't know, let's say 150 meters of the site of a, a certain point, you could do that. Um, and there's other options there like coordinates, uh, selecting the visible area will select the entire, everything that's on the screen. So let's go back to our polygon and just select the area around the power station. And now it's a matter of selecting the products that you want. So um, there are different categories here. So this person um, that needs the site plan, they would be looking at the OS master map and that is the most detailed topographic data that there is available of the UK. So within each category, there's a list of the different products and there's a little arrow on the right where you can open up a product info box to try and get a little bit more information about it. And importantly, it tells you what the current version is. So um, if you download this product, you're getting data from August of last year. And these are the available formats. Um, we are largely dependent on the formats which the data providers give the data to us in. But there are some instances where our engineers do create um, other formats, um, particularly for um, AutoCAD, I would say, Emma, is that fair to say? So that's a really popular one. So we do try and cater to that um, where possible. Sorry, Viv, I missed your original question. AutoCAD is the most popular uh, CAD package we come across. Yes, because um, I think Autodesk offer a free version for students. So uh, it's a bit like the Microsoft thing. Um, if they give it free to students, then all the students get really trained in it. And then when they go out into business, all the businesses have to buy AutoCAD because they can't get any workers who can use anything else. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a classic <laughs> business strategy. Yeah, um, yeah. But yes, AutoCAD is the most common one. Okay, um, but yeah, it's, you know, we tell you here what formats we provide it in, um, but you know, you, you need to go and do the research um, on the package that you intend to use it in to find out what the most appropriate one is. So once you have browsed and decided which data you want, so for this user, it would be topography, building height attribute, um, then this user also wanted some, uh, a backdrop map. So these are, this is another category of maps, which we have. Uh, these are all raster maps, um, scanned digital images of maps. Um, so this user, something like the, the master map raster or a vector map, or one to 25,000 raster might be suitable. Um, so once they've decided on their products, it's a matter of selecting this add to basket button at the bottom here. Viv, can I add something about the master map raster? Yeah, of course. I just thought of um, quite frequently we get people who say I must, must, must have master map data because I need the individual building outlines and the road edgings and so on. Um, if you download the vector version, it can be quite a complicated data set to deal with. If you don't need to do any analysis with the vectors, we would strongly suggest that if you're using it just as a backdrop that you go for the master map raster version because it is just a picture. It's much easier to load. If what you want to do is draw things on top, use that rather than try to use the vector version because it's much simpler. Okay, thanks, Emma. Now, I'm trying to select my add to basket button, but for some reason, it doesn't want to do that. Have you already added it? Oh, right, okay. It's to do oh. with the data set. Um, it says there's one of the particular data sets. There isn't data in my particular area. It'll be the building heights. Of yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay, so the basket... Um, we get a lot of queries for people that need, um, they want to compare data from different years. So um, within the basket, that's where you find those kind of options. So the second column here is version. So then you can select which particular date you want the data for, whether it's, you know, the, de the default is obviously the most recent one, but you could also like, select one from last year. Um, then this is key, to, key to, to select the right format. So for this user, it would be the DWG format. 
and then for some of the products, not all, there is a different theme. So this is kind of like the base maps that you saw. Some of them, there may be like a black and white version or a, a more simplified version of it. But it's really relating to the cartography and how the data looks. So we'll select the plan for that one. And the only one, it does highlight where it's essential to select um, an option. So the building attribute, again, I'll take DWG format. So it's a matter of working your way through the products, getting the options that you want, and then um, requesting the download. And then you're given a, a file confirming your order, and then a second file to tell you when it's ready. Um, we do our kind of guarantee is that your data will be ready within two days. Typically, most um, orders are ready much, much quicker than that. I would say for me, typically it's within 10 minutes, half an hour. But we do occasionally have users which download very big data sets and that can take longer. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Emma. I know we've done a lot of work over the years to ensure that people do get their data as quickly as we can. It very much depends on how much data is being requested and how many other people are also requesting how much data at the same time. So there is a queuing system and we try to organise the queue in a sensible way so that, you know, the small things get spat out first. Um, for me, you're right, Viv, I find that I get the your data is ready for collection email comes before the your order has been received. So there is also the notion that the delay can be caused by the email coming through. The data might be ready, but the email telling you it's ready can be delayed in all sorts of systems. So that could be either a delay in sending the email through mail relays, which is the problem, or a delay in receiving the email, which is another mail relay problem at the other end. Um, so we do say two days to allow for worst case scenario, but the chances are it'll be with you within four or five hours tops, I would think. So we've looked at data download and the, the options in the basket. Okay, so copyright wise, um, the maps, um, and data within Digimap are for educational use only. Um, you have to acknowledge the maps that you've used in print or online. Um, the prints that we provide have an acknowledgement on them. So uh, this is an Ordnance Survey collection map, but each collection will have their own acknowledgement on the maps that you print. Um, we do know that um, some people prefer, or you know, perhaps unwittingly, crop those maps or map images, at removing that copyright statement. Um, but you know, the terms of the license that everyone agrees to is that they will acknowledge the maps. So um, we do have some help available. We've got the license agreements here, which tell you what you can and can't do um, within each collection. And there's also a bit of guidance here on um, citation. Um, Emma, I don't know what you'd like to say. I'm going to, I've got a slide to follow on from this, just a little bit of um, guidance on citations, but I don't know if you want to mention any distinctions between licensed and open data within the different collections? Um, yes, the, there is a uh, the two types of data in, in Digimap. One is is open data, so we provide the open data simply because it makes it easy to get all the data you need in one place. Um, so some of the data you will see, if you look in the um, information panel associated with the data download, it will tell you which license goes with that particular data set. Similarly, in Rome, the map information panel, which is the last tab on the bottom of the left hand panel that will tell you which license applies to the data set you're looking at. The open data is is open so you can use it for whatever purpose you like within all reason. You don't, don't do anything illegal with it <laughs> so, uh, but beyond that it's, it's up to you what you do. Um, but the license data has um, particular license conditions attached to it which are specific to Digimap. These are education licenses so you're permitted to do all sorts of things that you maybe you wouldn't be allowed to do under a, a, a commercial license. Um, if there's something you want to do and you don't think it fits within the license that Digimap offers, there is always a way to do it. It's just a question of finding the right license to do it with. So we can help you find the right people to get the right license. So do come and ask. Um, the other thing I was going to say is the citation thing um, is very important. So the, the suppliers of our data, so wouldn't serve ACH, get mapping and so on. Um, are very happy for academics to use the data, that's fine, but they do want to see it acknowledged properly. They do check. We do get them coming back to us every so often saying, mm, is this one of your users? Mm, are you making sure they're using the right copyright statements and citations and so on? So I would, um, if you are if you are a student with a, a, a reference list to write, then please make sure that the right stuff is in there. If you are um, teaching, please press upon your students that this is important. 
um, just because it's on the web, it doesn't mean to say it's free. We, we went through a period about 10, 15 years ago where everybody assumed that because it was available from a website, it was free and you could just do what you wanted with it, which of course was never the case. Um, I think that's all I want to say for that. Super, thank you. I've put a little um, link to our citation um, help page on here. And I've just put in a very simple sample citation for a map created in Rome, the name of the, the person who's created it, their title, format, scale, so on. Um, crucially, the, the data that's been used, the currency of it, and where the user has sourced it from and the date of creation. So um, I'll send you this for reference. I mean, obviously the format of the, the citation will depend on the, the referencing system that you use. But I've just, um, you know, mentioned the, what we would suggest to include the fields, an example, and crucially where you can get that information. Um, for some of them, the map information menu in Rome, which I'm realizing now I did not show you, and I do apologize, but it tells you within the map information, the name of the product and the date, the currency of it. Um, so that's a little bit of guidance on citations from Rome. Um, if you've actually downloaded the data, um, it can be more straightforward because we do provide um, citations with that data. So this image here is a, an image of a download file. So um, I've got my building heights data in that folder, my topographic data in there. And I also am given a citation text file. Um, so a user can open that up and this is the, the citation that's provided to them. So that is all we had. Um, I don't know if we want to, if there's any questions outstanding, we could look at those or if people have things they want me to demo, um, just put that in the chat and I can flip back over and have a look. Um, otherwise, if people are content to go, then thank you very much for joining us and um, we'll send a recording, slides and any other useful links to you as soon as possible. Viv, worth adding that uh, our YouTube channel has got lots of videos of everything in Digimap pretty much if you want to um, see something rather than have it written down. It's always worth having a look. That Viv's put together some playlists of how to use data download, how to use Roam and so on. And there are smaller videos, one or two minutes, on particular features within the service. Thanks, Emma. Someone's asking about arc map training. Um, I'm not aware of anyone that does actual training, but um, certainly ArcGIS's um, training and resource area is fantastic. You know, there's so many excellent training um, guides and, and videos in there. So that would be my first port of call. So you might also, yeah, Viv, you might try, es Esri might do webinars and things on ArcMap. Um, there are also a lot of videos on YouTube on how to use um, particular aspects of the service. Okay, thanks. I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, someone's yes. saying, so uh, copyright is dropped out. Yeah, quick kind of copyright statements. If it's cropped out, you need to add it. You need to put it back. It's a very simple answer. <laughs> It has yeah, to I mean, the acknowledgement can just be a little caption under the image or something. It, yes, it has to be with the map, if not on yeah. it. Grid reference label, 10 figures. Um, we we put the grid reference um, as 10 figures uh, simply because that's the, the, the one that most people have requested. Um, but I know that we've had some comments about that and we're looking at how we can reduce that so that it gives you an appropriate grid reference depending on the scale of the map you're looking at. Um, Someone's made a comment it. about if you're affiliated if you're affiliated with the university, the archaeology department should provide training with ArcGIS. I that does that vary a lot between institutions, yes. doesn't it? Yes, that will depend on which university. Um, but there are um, there are many many universities do provide some kind of training with ArcGIS, so it is worth asking at home, as it were, to see what's available. Do we have any direct integration with ArcGIS? No, Digimap is effectively a standalone web service. How do I get two types of data from the same for the same scene from different sensors? Uh, Mohammed, I'm, I'm not quite sure where your sensors are or what, what kind of sensors you're using. Um, Digimap doesn't bring any data directly from sensors. So is this your own data that you your own data sensors that you've got? Perhaps you could email us with that question and we'll take a closer look at it. 
Uh, we will send a video of the recording today, Viv. I don't know how how people can watch that. Can can you explain that? Um, I get the recording from Zoom um, probably sometime this afternoon, and I'll post it on YouTube. So most likely tomorrow, um, when I'll, I'll send everyone who registered the URL to that. Okay. Now someone did say they wanted to see historic. So yeah. So shall I just flip over and quickly do a, a demo of the historic room? Yeah, go ahead, Viv. I think that'd be useful. Okay. So I did mention that um, the the room applications are, you know, they they all follow the same structure, but there are some variations. So what you'll see in Historic Rome is that the main um, variation is the timeline above the map window to allow you to select a decade um, and see if there's any maps available within there. What are in here are Ordnance Survey maps um, from the, the Mount, oh, I haven't looked at historic maps for so long, Emma, um, dating from what, 1830s up to the 19. 90s really um, the until the introduction is, of the digital maps yeah the earliest one i think is 1840s yeah so i've just searched for london um now this is quite frequent within um, historic rome as it will tell you there's no historic maps of this location available and because we're dealing with by and large pre-1950s the county maps you know there is you can't guarantee that there's a map available for each decade because counties were surveyed by county surveyors at varying uh, you know time intervals so it is a matter of you know uh, trial and error i guess to try the different decades and see what there is so although there's nothing available in this area i think the, the, the decades for which there are no maps are shaded in gray so you yes. you're just best picking a white one yeah okay so let's try the 1880s okay so we can see we've got hyde park westminster here what you'll notice is, again, a common issue with historic maps, uh, with the county maps, um, is that if you can visualise, there's lots of these paper maps that have been scanned and the coordinates um, added to them. Once you view the maps for a particular area, because there may be one more than one county map and they're sort of overlaid on the top, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. Um, but that frequently happens in London because you've had the counties of Middlesex, Kent and so on. and um, I'm not really sure why, Emma, but I, I heard that surveyors frequently went a little bit over their county boundary as a, a safety safety thing to make sure they got everything. I suspect there were also, I mean, it was surveyors were employed by the county to do a particular job and they, they may have had their own vested interest in doing a little bit extra here, there and everywhere. They may have been instructed to, a bit, to do a bit extra. I, I, I don't know. It, I'm sure there are many people, there may be some people on this call who know way more about it than I do. Yeah. And for anyone who's really interested, there is a, um, the British Cartographic Society have a map curators group and they are an absolute mine of information about this sort of thing. Which is really tricky. And the British Library has lots and lots of excellent um, help on, on the historic maps as well, I think, doesn't it? OK, so how you deal with this um, is we have an overlapping map selection tool. Um, so hopefully you can see this um, in the left hand panel here. This shows me all these little blue polygons show me those are the maps that are on just which are on display on your screen right now. Essex, Middlesex, Kent and Surrey. So I'm just going to select one. I'll select the radio button for Middlesex. And um, that clears, that means I'm only viewing one map now. So that clears away that. So that is really a key tool to be aware of when you're viewing the historic maps. It doesn't happen everywhere, but it's more likely um, to happen certainly in central London. It's more likely to happen where the boundaries of counties have been jiggled about and yeah, re point. reshuffled for over time, yeah. Okay, so um, now I've got my Middlesex map. It's, um, I'm just gonna change um, decades. So this is 1890s and you can just go through right up um, until the 1990s. Um, actually, I'm, I don't think I explained myself very clearly there. In the 1880s, I selected the Middlesex map, but that doesn't mean that that is what is shown in the 1890s. Um, you do have to you know, keep checking what it is you're viewing. Um, so in this 1920s, I think it could be useful now to show you the two up view. This is a, a nice feature within the historic maps. Um, 
so I'm viewing 1920s in the left hand window here and then I can select any decade I wish from the right hand window here. Um, so it's the same scale of map, um, but I can just compare compare the two. Um, probably central London is not the most, you know, striking place to to see that. Um, a really popular place, which some of our colleagues often use in these kind of examples, is Milton Keynes, um, because then you can see very clearly the urban development um, over time. So let's say, for example, there's Milton Keynes in the 1920s. If I Try and find one in the 80s. So you can do some nice um, comparisons using the two up tool. I'm not sure what else to tell you about these other than, ah, yeah, this feature information tool, um, which I showed you when I looked at the points of interest in Ordnance Survey Room. If I select that from the top toolbar and click on the map, it tells me what I'm looking at here. So I'm looking at a county sheet for Buckinghamshire at a scale of 1 to 10,560. So is that an inch to a mile, Emma? And it's the second revision for a particular county and the year it was um, published. Sorry, mute problem again. Yes, I think so. Yeah. And I can do the same um, over on this 1980s map here. And you can see that this isn't a county map because post-World War II, they switched to national grid um, mapping. But it tells me the particular national grid tile name that um, this area. Um, relates to that I'm viewing, published in 1987. The data source is Landmark Information Group. That's where um, they provide Adina with all of these maps. Um, and I think when they were digitised, that some of the information, such as publication dates, was lost. However, Adina has worked with um, some other uh, providers, National Library of Scotland, and other people to try and uh, you know claw back that information. Um, so I think by and large, they've managed to, to cover that for all the maps now, Emma. Is that right? Yes, I think so. Um, we've got some questions about whether you can overlay the maps rather than put them side by side. Um, we, we have tried the overlay thing with the historical maps, but it gets awfully messy. Um, so the, the contemporary maps are underneath this. If you use the opacity sliders there, I think you can yep. see the, um, the contemporary map underneath the historical one. Um, or maybe not. But um, to put the two side by side and be able to, to see two different time periods side by side was a, a better way of working with the data that we've got. I'm going to um, go to see Edinburgh and I'm going to try and zoom in to show you guys the, the town plans, because although I've mentioned these county maps, what I really love are the, the town plans, which are the really, really detailed ones which were done of um anyway the town plans um i think those are when you get into the really nice stuff where it's actually got building uh you know building names listen it uh, listed and you can see things here like Holyrood brewery old gas works you know this is where i think there's the really fun stuff to look at let's check when this so this is a 1900s one uh 1908 published in 1908, surveyed 1905. So this is when there's, um, you know, I think you can do some nice comparisons um, and you get the really nice detail. Depends on your uh, on your requirements, of course, and what, what your project is. But my tip is, I suppose, not just that they're there, but sometimes you can get to a point where you're a bit more zoomed out and you zoom in and it tells you there's nothing available Sometimes you have to zoom in as far as you can before you see these town plans. Um, so don't ever think, oh, there's nothing else there. I would always try and keep zooming in to see what you can find. But yeah, you're not going to find these town plans, which are a high level of detail in smaller villages and smaller towns. It was for towns with a particular um, population. I'll try and find some of our, our help pages or perhaps um, data from the British Library on that. And, and send those links out as well. Viv, important to remember that it was the population at the time the maps at the were time, made, at the not time, the population yeah. of the place now. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone would have one. <laughs> Everyone would have one, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, there's all the same tools available, except we don't have any of those overlays that you saw in Ordnance Survey. Um, it's, it's been a matter of deciding what was um, most useful for users. 
So none of those overlo other overlays seem to kind of fit well with the historic data, but you can add in overlays. So this is what you could do. You could take the web map service for Ordnance Survey Collection and add it in here and try and view them together. I don't have that, unfortunately. Sorry, I don't have that web map service listed um, in here today. But I can try and make a little video of that and send that. Someone says they've downloaded historic maps of the areas I'm looking in, but what's the best program to access these in? The download maps are downloaded in a TIFF image format, aren't they, Emma? Yep, they also come with what we call TFW files, which are known as world files. Those are important because if you want to load the map images into a GIS application, the TFW files will tell the software where to put that map in space. So if you had all the TFW files and all the TIFFs in one folder, it will then tile your TIFFs nicely to make one big map. If you take the TFWs away, you'll end up with one map image on top of each other, all in the same space. So yeah, um, Hayden, if you want to, uh, like I said in the chat there, if you want, if the location of your maps is really important, then I would load them into a GIS application. So QGIS is an open source one, which is free to, to download and install. Um, it's pretty straightforward. There are lots and lots of um, tutorials online for how to use it. We've got some basic instructions in our help pages as well. If you've got access to ArcGIS, that's also just as good, does the same kind of thing, slightly different way. Um, if all you want to do is have a, a like a photograph that you can scribble on, then any kind of um, image software like Paint or Photoshop would would do for those TIFF images. Okay, so that's after twelve now. So I think we'll leave it there. Um, if anyone, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch tomorrow um, with recordings and everything, um, and whatever useful links I can find to send you. Um, but you know, please don't ever be stuck just reach out um, and you know we get lots and lots of queries and uh, Emma and other very knowledgeable GIS and geospatial data people are there to answer them so thanks for coming along here. and um, yeah good luck with it and but yeah we're here whenever you need any help.